Welcome to another 21 Hats Dashboard brought to you by our sponsor, The Great Game of Business. I'm Lauren Feldman, and I'm here with Sean Bussey to talk about the things we think business owners should be thinking about this week. Sean is CEO and founder of Kinesis, which is based in Portland, Oregon, and works with small businesses on marketing, culture, and strategy. Welcome back to Dashboard, Sean. Hey, good to see you, Lauren. Great to have you here. Uh, Sean, a few weeks ago, we had a conversation about what business owners should think about when deciding how to spend their money on marketing. I'd like to come back to to marketing again. Um, I'm never any shortage of marketing topics to to kick around, but mostly because... um, it can it can be so difficult, so fraught. And I read a story recently and highlighted it in the uh, morning report that just really kind of threw me. The, the, the story, and I know you saw it, um, it was the Wall Street Journal accusing Forbes of running a digital advertising scam. And essentially what they said uh, was that advertisers paid Forbes for ad placements, but the ads didn't run on Forbes. They ran on an alternative site that was stuffed with slideshows and listicles and other low-rent journalism. Um, And the alternative site had nowhere near the same quality of demographics, let alone journalism, as the as the main Forbes site. And the advertisers had no idea that this was going to happen. Forbes blamed the ad tech company that manages their ad bidding software, and they shut down the site as soon as the Wall Street Journal called them on it. <laughs> I guess my question for you is, it was just kind of stunning to me. Were you surprised by this? Is this um, an isolated incident, or do you think this is something that people who uh, engage in digital advertising should be aware of? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'd like to say I was surprised by. I, here's what I was surprised by: I was surprised by one media giant calling out another media giant. <laughs> that, was, that was something else. That's not something you see every day. Um, I guess I was less surprised that people were paying for something that they thought had value and it didn't have value. And and I think that's a, a theme I've I've seen for a while now and it seems to be ever increasing. You know, I mean you you had Gene on not that long ago, Gene Marks, and and he ran a little experiment where he paid for traffic through, you know, paid social on channels Twitter. on Twitter saying, Hey, I want this keyword. I want traffic for this keyword. And then he set up a dedicated landing page, which he installed Google analytics on. So he could see when people landed on the page and one tech behemoth Twitter said, we're sending you hundreds of thousands of clicks. And then the other text, you know, company said, nobody's coming. So who do you believe? I I tend to believe the Google in this instance in that I don't think Twitter was actually sending him business, you know, and that's just a small test. But um, so these are two examples. Um, Yeah. I know most of our listeners are not going to – we're not going to run out and advertise on Forbes anyway. Um, yeah, but sure. is there a, a lesson to be learned to the, from this? How do you know what, if you're getting what you're paying for? I mean, the lesson is, is kind of buyer beware. And, you know, I mean, I hate to say – I hate to say it and I, and I hate to say – I wish I could give you a like answer. Oh, do this and you'll be okay. You know, I, I just think that the – what has happened is that the massive proliferation of tech – tech and tech moving into the marketing and advertising world has meant kind of a wild west uh, in terms of what's reliable and, and what, what is suspicious. And, and even, you know, Forbes, <laughs> you know, in addition to this like little scandal thing, <laughs> they've been running all kinds of stuff for a long time, like the con- contributor model where they would just allow anybody to buy a spot on their website you know, no filtering for quality and so forth. Well, that's not exactly right. All right. <laughs> Maybe I'm a little I, I was responsible it. for the entrepreneur's contributor channel there for a while, and I hated yeah. it. That's all your fault. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I inherited it. I didn't create it. Um, and, I, and I tried my best. But I, I think it's emblematic of just what a tough time it's been over the last 10, 15 yeah. years for media yeah. companies. And they have struggled to find business models that work. And at Forbes, it, you know, it was, you know, it was no secret. We, we, we talked about it openly. The journalism that went into the print publication was something that the people who worked there were really proud of. And they did a lot of great work. But th- that wasn't paying for itself. They needed to yeah. find other ways. And I think that's, 
probably why they went down the road of this digital advertising scam we're talking about. And it certainly was part of the problem with the uh, contributor network where they hired, I, I say hired, they got a bunch of people to write for them, but they didn't pay them mostly. Some, if they had huge traffic numbers, which was rare, did get paid. Uh, and some got paid a lot, but but most didn't get paid and none of them got edited. And that's the key. You know, it wasn't the quality mm-hmm. journalism that people were used to right. associating with Forbes. So it was it was kind of a shortcut designed to pay for the work that they really wanted to do. And I think that is you know, that's part of the problem we're discussing here, where you you end up with a lot of companies doing things, you know, looking for quick, easy clicks, and you don't know if you're getting the demographics that you're you're being promised. Yeah. You know, it's funny, as we were talking about this, I'm like, oh, I've seen this story before, and, and it reminds me of my early days in, in my career. So we're talking like 1998, 99. The parallel is actually the Yellow Pages. Interesting. Yeah. So uh, Yellow Pages would hire very young, eager sales reps and they would pay them on commission and they would go out and sell ads, right? They would sell space in the Yellow Pages and they might upcharge Does you for- know what the Yellow Pages is now, Sean? I know. I'm dating myself. <laughs> I know. I, I, uh, what, what, what are the Yellow Pages, Sean? Okay. It's a book that you use to hold a door open. Um, so, <laughs> no, <laughs> you know, back in pre-internet times, it was how you found phone numbers for businesses. And so- It was a for, big, thick book. It was a big, thick they, book. They yeah. gave away for free to everybody. Right, and yes. And you, you know, if you needed a plumber, you looked in the yellow pages. Right. And you know, what's interesting, it's like Google in that way, right? Google is free to use for the user. So you can look up to try to find what you need in Google and who pays for that service is the people, you know, that get served up to your browser. And it, it's kind of the same as the yellow pages. And in that, if you needed a plumber, you didn't have one, that was kind of where you would go unless you happen to see an ad, you know, in a newspaper. And so why I think there's a parallel here is this yellow page sales reps, they don't care one freaking lick as to whether or not you would be successful with your ad in their publication. They just cared about selling you the spot. And there were many businesses that benefited mightily from being in the yellow pages. And there are many businesses that actually don't benefit very much. There are many businesses where they'd only need a tiny little listing and that would be enough and would be sold a half page. There would be other businesses who actually would benefit from a half page. So there was value in the yellow pages. But for the buyer to discern where they should spend that money or if they should at all, it was really, really hard. And and the sales reps would take advantage of the lack of knowledge in the same way that I think Forbes in their little scheme was taking advantage of business owners who didn't know what was going on or advertisers who didn't know what was going on. So I think it's the same story. It's just different a different setting, if you will. And and that I think is the the message I would say in terms of like, I don't have an answer in terms of like how you how you don't get predated upon as a business owner, other than to say it really helps to have somebody in your corner who can help you identify what's the right thing to do and then to evaluate how it's working. You know, and you can DIY that, but it's really hard if you've never done it before. Let me ask you this. When, when I highlighted that Wall Street Journal story in the morning report, I put a headline on it that said something about, I forget what it was, it was something like, uh, another reason uh, not to trust uh, digital marketing, I think it was. And somebody called me on it and said, wait a second, this was a problem with digital advertising, not digital marketing. Right. Did they have a point? Were they right about that? You know, I hadn't thought about it, but that's a great point. You know, I I often throw digital under the bus. And part of the reason I do that is that I do feel it's a space where there's a lot of snake oil and there's a lot of predation going on. But the problems are greater in digital advertising uh, than in digital marketing? Mm. Or what's the distinction? Probably. Yeah, probably. They probably are, are, the problems are greater in the advertising space. But I, I guess where I was going to go with this is like, you know, I engage in digital stuff all the time for my business. I mean, if you are connected to me on LinkedIn, you're probably tired of hearing from me. You know, like I, I'm, I'm pretty much always talking and sharing and trying to help people 
it's a very active digital channel for me, but it's not advertising. Yeah. It's marketing. It's marketing. It's marketing. And and we have tried advertising on LinkedIn, but honestly, it's it's not been nearly as effective as as the kind of boots on the ground marketing outreach one to one connection. So I think there are great digital marketing plays you can make that are legit. There are probably scams out there too. And and then advertising is a very dangerous realm if you've never done it before. So I want I, I think I've heard you say, I think you, you've referred to it on the uh, on the regular podcast, uh, the weekly podcast a few times, that you feel as though kind of the, the free era of marketing is over, that content marketing doesn't work the way it used to. And yet you're putting a lot of time and energy into uh, what I would call content marketing on, on LinkedIn. I, explain uh, your thinking there. How do you view that? Right. Talking out of both sides of my mouth. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you have a good explanation. Yeah. So so for context, you know, for anybody who's listening to this, um, you know, we've had quite a journey at Kinesis uh, in terms of this space. So in 2003 or four, my then business partner, you know, as much as she drove me crazy in lots of ways and I ended up buying her out, she had some good ideas along the way. And one of the things she was very prescient about was content marketing. She started, she was a writer and she started writing article after article after article after article. And it was called article marketing at the time. It wasn't called content marketing. Really? It was called article marketing. Wow. I mean, I'm that old. So, um, <laughs> so she would put these articles all over the internet and it was crazy. You know, we, we would put keywords in there like marketing, websites, brands, you know, design, that kind of stuff, the stuff we were doing at the time in, in great amounts. And then the word Portland. And so <laughs> we were page one of Google at the top for a lot of these terms that today, like if you wanted to pay for that position, would cost you an ungodly sum of money. So we were able to basically get all this traction uh, in the early days because people didn't know about the opportunity. And we were early to it and, and we were there for a long time. I mean, we, we kind of played that game for, for years and it was a good deal. I mean, for for some small amount of time, she's a really good writer. She's fast. Um, and, and her secret trick was she knew how to write readable articles, not garbage. Um, and it, it paid a ton of dividends. We were able to move into new markets. We weren't in Portland originally. So when I moved to Portland, I had no network here. We would get business here. People would like call us up, you know? So it was kind of like I had this giant full page ad in the yellow pages and no one else had an ad in there. It was great. Um, but then over time, you know, what I started to see happen is Google kept like changing its algorithm. And then I started to see like, oh, now it's taken the organic stuff and it's placing the advertising stuff in a blue bar and it's, it's, so it's st making it stand out. And then I, and I started to figure out not only is Google changing what it wants to do, which is to make money also, Everybody else in the world was figuring out the same thing. And so uh, what I what I have observed is that that stuff, which was once easy and like almost like free, you know, free business now is becoming a pay is becoming has become a pay to play space. It wasn't really free, right? Because you had to no. you had to pay somebody to do it, and yes. it, either yeah. it was, you know, a partner like you had who did it well, or you had to hire somebody with real skills. Yeah. But you weren't paying for placement. Wasn't paying for placement, you know, and, and yeah, we're diminishing the value of our time, which is worth something. Um, you know, back then we were small, so that time wasn't very, <laughs> very worthy, worth much. But, uh, but yeah, yeah. And I think you've had other folks on the show who've kind of figured out those kinds of moves too, you know, um, back in the day. Um, but I don't, I don't recommend people do that today because it's just, it's not an effective play in that way that we practiced it. You know, I spend a lot of time on LinkedIn, which is a, so, a social channel. It's it's uh, uh, digital. Part of my reason for that is because I'm interested in one to one relationships. I'm not interested in one to min like one to thousands or tens of thousands, like a lot of brands are. So LinkedIn allows me to build to both create and build and develop relationships in a pretty meaningful way. Again, it takes energy. It takes time. There's a strategy to it. It's not free, but I'm not paying for placement. And it's it's more like human networking than it is anything else. So do you advise people against 
creating a robust blog on their own website where they answer the kinds of questions that their customers bring up to them on a regular basis and try to build a following that way? Is, is, do you think that doesn't work anymore? I don't know if it's binary, like it, it doesn't work anymore and it used to work great. Uh, it's probably, there might be room there. You know, it depends on how competitive the space is and who else is doing it. But I, I want to believe that if you send good content out into the world um, and you do it in a smart and strategic way, that you can find an audience. I hate to think that those days are completely over. I don't think they're totally over. I, I just think that it's a lot harder and the more commoditized your business, the harder it's going to be. So if I sell plumbing parts, you know, a lot of companies sell plumbing parts. Now, maybe that's an old guard industry that has not moved into content marketing. And, and so there, maybe there is an opportunity there. But I just, by and large, it's, a, it's an overused playbook. And so I think you've got to find more creative ways to get content out there. Um, yeah. So, so that's, I think, something that's worthwhile to think about. I mean, the, the social channels was like the answer for, for a while. The social channels were the answer, right? Okay. Uh, Google's gotten harder, more expensive. Now social and get followers and, you know, get traction there. That worked for a while. And now I saw a great presentation at South by Southwest by the uh, CEO of Patreon. And he was essentially saying the 2010s, was the era of the follower, right? Getting people who are your fans to subscribe and follow you, right? And he's right. And you could really build a lot of momentum that way. And he said that with the evolution of TikTok, it's, he, he thinks this has the potential to be the death of the follower. This era, the 2020s, the death of the follower and really the rise of engagement, right? Like, or even enragement, right? So where the algorithm is is feeding you all this new stuff all the time to where the things that you were following they get, they get pushed to the bottom and and I've seen this happen right like I I really love YouTube I love YouTube for learning about machining and woodworking and all this stuff I have all these people that I was following and I was getting their content all the time super stoked right I know some of them are still creating content I don't ever see their stuff unless I like seek it out and I think what's happening is YouTube is mimicking TikTok and it's, it's um, high diversity of content from all over the place because they want to keep you scrolling constantly. They don't care whether you're engaged with, with your, with fans are engaged with their audience, you know, with their, um, who they're, who they're following. So that's a big change. That's a huge change. And how do you navigate through that? Well, I think part of the reason TikTok does it too is like not only does it keep you on their platform longer, <laughs> it keeps you engaged. It also allows them to say, hey, would you like to break through all that noise and to reach this audience? Just give us some money. So it's not about the quality of the content anymore. It might be for some little bit of their algorithm, but if you really want to get and stay with your customers, the algorithms are not going to encourage that without money. <laughs> So, so again, it's the same evolution. It was free, free. I put that in quotes. It was free. You had to put out good content. You had to have meaningful stuff. You would get followers. You get people pay attention to you. And then eventually the platform will flip a switch and say, we're going to now monetize this. So if you want to keep, keep in this space and you want your customers to still care about you, you have to give us money. And that's tough. Everything good gets destroyed when, when everybody rushes in. Uh, yeah. It works for a while. And then There's a great blog post. It's called like the unshitification of everything. And it's essentially that idea that these things that were once great. Except for podcasts, right, Sean? Podcasts are always going to be great. Until you flip that switch, Lauren, this is the best podcast. <laughs> I mean, we could talk about the change of podcasts, which I see happening right now. Tell me. Well, so I was listening to a really great podcast called How I Built This with Guy Raz. Um, it's a really great podcast for entrepreneurs. If, have you heard it? It might be the best known business podcast out there. It grew out of NPR and um, it, you know people love it. it. It's great. Yeah, really good content. And I can remember I, I kind of early phase of pandemic or pre-pandemic, it was like top rotation for me. I was listening to it all the time. And there were pretty much no ads in it, almost none. <laughs> and somehow the algorithm 
kicked it up to me. <laughs> you know, I don't know how, how it got in my feed, but I was listening to it the other day and I was like, whoa, man, that's a lot of ads I got to wade through just to get to the beginning of the show. And then I get into the show and I think, okay, great. I've waded through the ads, whatever. <laughs> I get a little show and there's another ad break. I'm like, man, okay. Some more show, another ad break. And so I was like, all right, wait, wait, wait a minute here. What's going on? So I, I sat down and I, and I tracked in my phone, okay, how many minutes of show? How many minutes of ad? How many minutes of show? How many minutes of ad? And what it came out to is basically in a 36 minute show, there were nine minutes of ads. Whoa. So 25% of the show was advertising from zero, right? Like <laughs> from like five or 10. And I thought, huh, I wonder how that compares to television. So then I did some research on television and sure enough, back in the day, you know, when you and I were younger, television ads might take up 20% of the show, you know, in an, in an hour show. And today it's 25 to 30%. So essentially podcasting has reverted to the mean of television, uh, which is ad sponsored, major interruptions, and probably high price. You probably have to pay a real premium to be on that show. So again, what's what's old is new again, uh, I think is, is what's going on here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you see, Sean, you just put your finger on something important, which is the reason there aren't tons of ads on the 21 Hats podcast is not <laughs> because I've been unable to sell those ads. It's because I care about the experience of my listeners, and I'm putting that first. I love it. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> I like that. I like it. You know, the other way to look at it, if you are listening to this and you have a business that sells to small businesses, it's a really good deal right now. So get in while you can. So thank you, Sean. <laughs> I I mean I actually I believe that. I think I think your content's really great and and probably there's a real opportunity for for businesses to be part of this. Everybody's got to think we planned this. We're, we're, we're not that smart. It's an infomercial. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. Sean Bussey is CEO of Kinesis, which is based in Portland, Oregon, and works with small businesses on marketing, culture, and strategy. This episode was brought to you by The Great Game of Business. See, I do sell some stuff, <laughs> which helps businesses use an open book management system to help build healthier companies. You can learn more at greatgame.com. Thank you, Sean. Thanks, Lauren. Have a great week, everybody.